And I won't even say the Ben Shapiro quip that is so famous. Oh, facts don't care about your feelings. It even goes further. It goes beyond that. It goes to the very heart of the issue that the glory of God is at stake here. And you cannot find peace apart from that. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode 145 of the Removing Barriers podcast. And in this episode, we will be discussing the claim by the LGBTQIA plus community that Eve, yes, Eve, the first woman ever created, was transgendered. Hi, this is Jay. MCG and I would like for you to help us remove barriers by going to removingbarriers.net and subscribing to receive all things Removing Barriers. If you'd like to take your efforts a bit further and help us keep the mics on, consider donating at removingbarriers.net slash donate. Removing Barriers, a clear view of the cross. All right, Jay. Of all the audios that we have played and reviewed on this podcast, I kind of think this one takes the cake. What do you think? This one is definitely crazy. I'll give you that one. We've played some pretty crazy clips, but this one, there's so many claims made in it. I don't know if I should call it crazy or what, but crazy, I guess it is. All right. Well, here's the audio of this person. I personally honestly cannot tell whether this person is a biological man who transitioned, quote unquote, to a biological woman or vice versa. But here's this transgendered person making the claim that Eve was transgendered. But did you know that Eve, the very first woman, as per the Bible, was made of Adam's rib bone? And because of this, Eve, if we're going to take it as literally as um, y'all like to, um, Eve would have had male DNA. So quite literally, if you were to have taken her DNA and looked at her chromosomes, which is another point randomly you guys like to make, it's like you believe in Adam and Eve, yet at the same time you like to quote science when you're attacking us. But anyways, if you were to look at the um, chromosomes of Eve, she would have Adam's chromosomes. So which is it are you gonna call eve a man now literally the very first woman are are you actually gonna call her a man because i thought it didn't matter how many surgeries we had or how early we started hormones etc i thought it never mattered because you can't change your chromosomes i mean i love me some god i love me some jesus but check your facts <laughs> All right, I think that's the epitome of logical fallacy. But anyways, God taking a rib from Adam's side to make Eve, did that make her transgender, Jay? In a word, no. The whole idea of transgender, and as I recently discovered, there's another word called transsexual, but that entire umbrella of people is defined as those who believe that they were born in the wrong body They are one gender or sex between the ears, but in terms of their psyche, but physically, it doesn't match with what they think that they are. Hands down, there is no indication in scripture that Eve struggled at all with her physical reality. And it would be absolutely ridiculous to call Eve transgender according to the Bible. You mentioned that there are a lot of logical fallacies there. I'm restraining myself right now, but you mentioned there are a lot of logical fallacies. What are some of the fallacies you see in this person's TikTok? Well, the first logical fallacy is that when was the last time you ever heard someone had a chance plant, quote unquote, and the doctor declared that since they got an organ from a member of the opposite sex, that all of a sudden now they too are a member of the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. I've never heard anyone declare anybody who may have gotten a kidney from a man and placed into a woman or vice versa. And all of a sudden, doctors say, well, because you get get a kidney from a man, all of a sudden you're a man. 
that's a logical fallacy. Sure. If you, and that's technically, if you want to say God took a rib from Adam and to create Eve. Or what about David Bennett? Who's that? Who successfully received a transplant of a pig's heart. He died two months later, but he lived two months with a modified pig's heart. Did the doctors declare him all of a sudden chance species because he had a heart from a pig? You know, logical fallacy. And, you know, doing computer science and doing logic classes and stuff like that, and this is nothing special. I didn't have to go to college to learn this. But when you're dealing with logic, if their premise is false, no matter what the conclusion is, it's going to be false too. Mm -hmm. Her premise is false. So no matter where she comes from from that, she's going to end up in a false place because she starts with a false premise. So that's why it's a logical fallacy. Her premise was that Eve must have been a transgender or transsexual man because she had male DNA. She had Adam's DNA. Because she had a rib from Adam. A that means she Adam. had Adam chromosomes, which is not true. So no, I will say definitely no. God taking a rib from Adam to create Eve did not make Eve transgendered. You said it's not true. Does that mean that Eve did not have male DNA or I have no evidence of that, that Eve had male DNA or chromosomes. Definitely not chromosomes. And it wasn't like God did a bone marrow transplant or something on Eve from Adam. A bone marrow transplant, she would have had Adam DNA, but still have XX chromosomes. So, yeah, any which way you cut it, it's a logical fallacy. But check your facts, she says, because if you have male chromosomes then you're obviously male. And so having a transplanted part in your body means that you have those chromosomes physically there in your body. So naturally, that's you being part male, right? No, Eve was... I mean, was, we're checking our facts, right? Eve was a woman in every way of the term, meaning since the term woman cannot be defined anymore, I will define it for you. <laughs> I'm smart enough to define woman. <laughs> Meaning an adult human with XX chromosomes or an adult human female. Again, Eve having a rib from Adam did not make her male. God didn't do a bone marrow transplant. And even if he did, that would not have made her male. He would have simply mean that Adam and Eve would probably have the same quote unquote DNA, but the chromosomes will still be XX and XY. And as you said, I don't think Eve was ever confused, nor was Adam confused when he saw Eve. Because when he saw Eve, he didn't say, oh, look, God has created another man. No, he put a wow in front of it. Nor did he say, hey, what are your pronouns? <laughs> he didn't well, say that's that that's true. <laughs> Anyways, Adam was wow when he saw Eve. And <laughs> anyways, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> okay, so I think she conflated a lot of stuff here. I don't even want to call this person a she because I'm fairly certain that this is a male posing as a female, but I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's just some, you know, activist who isn't one way or the other and is just making a, a TikTok video. But notice how they said, oh, well, you know, you say to us that no matter how much you do your surgery, no matter how many puberty blockers or hormones you take, you can't change your chromosomes. So are we going to say that? Eve is male because Eve has male DNA. So I failed paying attention in high school when they covered this section. I was under the understanding that when you're talking about DNA, chromosomes, genes, base pairs, the entire genome altogether, in regular speak, they're used interchangeably, but they actually mean specific things. They don't all mean the same thing. Am I wrong about that? No, you're not. Okay. So when we say that you can't change your chromosomes, when sane, normal people are saying you can't change your chromosomes, what we're saying is, correct me if I'm wrong, because I truly did fall asleep at this point in my high school <laughs> career, down to your very cell, every single cell in your body has the genetic material right there inside the nucleus that determines not just how the proteins are to be made, the proteins that come together to make the cells, that come to make together to make the tissue, that come together to make the organ, that comes together to make 
the systems that come together to make the organism. I remember that being right. the levels in which we're made. So when we say you can't change your chromosomes, what we're saying is all the way down to the cell, you are XX or XY. Right. The body develops differently based on that. That's yep. the only point in which men and women differ, male and female differ, is the sex chromosome. And well, I think there are other differences, but the other differences that are a direct result of having the XX as opposed to the XY. So all of the secondary right. traits that we see. Right. OK. So when this person says that Eve must have been transgender because she has a rib from Adam's side, this person is conflating two things. Transgender is a fairly new term that people use to explain why they feel like they are uncomfortable in their body. It doesn't address the hard biological fact that you are either male or female. There is no conflating of those two things, even though they like to do that. I would agree with that, that it's more of a software issue than a hardware issue. So if it's more of a software issue than a hardware issue, why on earth, let's say, hypothetically, let's play into her argument, why on earth would it even matter that Eve had a rib from Adam's side? It doesn't, as I said, it's a logical fallacy because she's saying that because her, let's say, her opponents are saying, or he or her or whatever she is or he is, saying that you cannot change your chromosomes. It right. comes down to your biological makeup. Well, then, if that's true, according to this person, mm -hmm. then Eve's biological makeup was of a man. Yet, we don't have a problem saying Eve was a woman, but we have a problem saying that this person is a man or a woman or whatever, despite their biological makeup being different. So she's basically saying that we are not being consistent, consistent. in our application, which is not true. Not true. I guess the question begs at this point, what does the rib from Adam's side mean? Here's what I'm getting at, right? Because when God created man, the entire scriptures point to the fact that he created them, he created us in his image. The Bible is very clear, James 3, 9, Genesis 9, 6, that when God said, let us make man in our own image, it's tied to, uh, particularly in the Genesis verse, let us make man in our own image or that God made us in our own image, male and female created he them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's almost, correct me if I'm wrong, MCG, but it, it's inextricable. Our maleness and our femaleness, the way that God made us, we are made in his image. That is a part of being made in his image. What I mean by that is I've heard people say, let me backtrack a little bit here. I've heard people say that God took the rib as opposed to a piece of the skull as opposed to a piece of the foot, because Eve was meant to be man's companion. She was made from his side so that she could be a perfect companion from him, not from the head, not to lead him or contend with him, not from the foot so that she wouldn't be like a doormat or being trampled over. But I think that there's so much more to it than that. God made Adam from the dust of the earth, but he breathed into Adam the breath of life, and he became a living soul, the Bible says made in God's image. Now, from the woman, he didn't go back to the dust to make her. He made her from him. Like from the very beginning, her existence was dependent on him. She did not come into being apart from Adam. She was made from Adam. The headship that's there, he was first they talk about federal headship, Adam's federal headship over all of mankind, why we inherited his sin nature. That sin nature, it's a result of the headship and the federal headship of Adam. That same idea that she was made from him, dependent upon him to be made, if that makes any sense, if I'm trying to make mm -hmm. any sense here. She wasn't made as a standalone person. She was made from him is what I'm trying to get at. Right. And I think that points to the fact that she's made of the same stuff as him. She's not an animal or a frog or an apple or anything like that. She's a human being like him made in the image of God. I know one gentleman whose wife passed away and at her funeral, he described her. I think he was quoting someone else, but he used that description to describe her as dust twice refined. 
Adam came from the dust, she came from Adam, she's dust twice refined. That idea that she came from him, the headship, taken from his side to be a perfect companion. And again, as I say, there's more to it than that. She's the same as him, made of the same stuff, and yet very different, very different in the physical expression of her womanhood, who she was, but also in her role and in her relation to man. Same, but different. And that's very important because what transsexualism and what transgenderism attempts to do is erase all of that. The scriptures describe that as part of our being made in the image of God. And transgenderism, transsexualism tries to erase all of that. Ephesians 5.31 describes marriage as a mystery where even at the beginning in Genesis, it says that wherefore the man shall leave his father, leave his mother, cleave to his wife, and they too will become one flesh. Later on in the podcast, we're going to address this, but reiteration and the re-emphasis of male, female, male, female, male, female, mother, father, husband, wife, male, female, him, her. It seems like it's integral to our being made in the image of God, and they're seeking to erase that. Yeah, definitely. I think about Genesis 2, verse 20 to 22, the Bible says that Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Clearly there, you see a purpose for the creation of Eve. Mm -hmm. Adam realized, hey, all these animals come in pairs male, female, but there's not one for me. God provide a companionship for him, a woman. So God taking a rib from Adam, I agree with you. I think it shows that they're made of the same substance. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, for by one man sin entered to the world and death by sin. So they pass upon all men for that all have sinned. All of us go back to Adam, including Eve. Mm -hmm. All of us go back to Adam. So I think it should have at least Eve was made of the same substance as Adam. Genesis 2 verse 23, the Bible says that Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Again, you mentioned this as well. Talk about her position at the side of man to be and help me. And I think the quotation you were talking about was from the great theologian Matthew Henry. He mm -hmm. said, Eve was not taken out of Adam's head to top her, neither out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him under his arms to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved by him. Oh, I never heard the full quote. That's beautiful. I think I would agree with Matthew Henry there that everything that God did here shows not only the position of Eve, but also the responsibility of man, or of the husband. Mm -hmm. Because remember, God performed the first marriage at that point as well. So mm -hmm. God brought her unto Adam, performed the first marriage. Now, all the protection that a husband needs to give a wife is right there. All the headship and leadership of the home all encapsulated or symbolized in the fact that God took a rib from Adam to make Eve. If I could insert this too, that's okay. a powerful word that you use there, symbolizes, because God isn't just making people here. He is laying down the foundation for world without end for the world to come. He's not just making men and women. He is setting the anticipation for Christ himself. I go back to Ephesians 5.31, Paul calls marriage a mystery in that we can't fully understand it and appreciate it apart from Christ because it's a symbol, it's a representation, it's supposed to demonstrate to the world the relationship between Christ and the church. But God was already ahead of everybody. <laughs> Way back in Eden, he established that. So this person is reducing God's act of creating Eve from Adam's side reducing it to a purely physical act. And that's not what's happening in Scripture. That's also not what we're saying when we say to the transgender person, all the way down to your chromosomes, you are the actual gender and sex, which are the same thing, even though they say it's different. You are who you are. What we're pointing the transgender to is the fact that they are made in the image of God, whether or not they feel or think that they are or are not in this case, because they right. feel like they're in the wrong body. So it's not just a purely physical thing, although there is the biology there that is undeniable. You can't refute that. But we're also putting a finger on the spiritual reality, too, 
of all these things that we've already described. Yeah, and I say this as an aside. God taking a rib from Adam does not mean that, one, that man have one less rib than woman, or that Adam rib cage was compromised for the rest of his life. You know, a rib, depending on how it is removed, will grow back within a month or two. Yeah, I read that too. If yeah. the rib was removed with the perichondrium left intact, it will definitely grow back in a month or two. And God being the creator... I'm sure he knew that. ...would have known that mm-hmm. and would have left the perichondrium intact so Adam rib could grow back and he's not compromised. But I guess the question is, though, does God make people transgendered or does God make mistakes? God doesn't make mistakes and God doesn't make people transgendered either. Transgenderism, transsexualism, and every other type of deviation from God's standard of sexuality and of being altogether, any deviation from that is a result of our fallen nature, is a result of sin that has come into the world. God doesn't make mistakes. Sin has marred creation. We are fallen, fallen in all the ways you can think of, physically fallen, intellectually, mentally, spiritually, relationally, emotionally, experientially, you name it, it was all marred by sin way back when in the garden, when man decided that they wanted to be like God. They made that same sin, that same mistake, that same sin that the devil made in heaven when he declared, I will be like the Most High. I will have all of those infamous I will statements that he made. Man did the same thing in the garden. God said, no. Man said, eh, why not? And so by what we do or by what we don't do, when we sin against God, it is a divorcing ourselves from the Creator, from the source of life, from the God of all truth, from all of those different things. It is his benevolence, infinite and wonderful benevolence that he even attempted or even cared to create a way for us to be redeemed. He certainly didn't have to, but he did. And so for us to even make the insinuation somehow that God made me this way and God made a mistake and God made me transgender and I can't help it and blah, 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 that is impugning God and it's sinful. It's wrong. It's blasphemous. God does not make mistakes. I'll continue here and say that we should never allow ourselves to be comfortable with this fallenness. I think in many subtle ways we acquiesce to the fallenness, especially when we look at the issue of death, let's say, for example, when we say, oh, you know, well, death is a natural part of life and death is, I mean, what can you do? No, death is the enemy. Death is in the world as a result of sin. We weren't originally created to die, to be separated from God. We need to realize that sin is the culprit here, the scriptures talk about the sting of death being sin and the strength of sin is the law. It is the divorcing of ourselves from the decrees and the ways and the statutes and the person of God that brings about all of this transgenderism that we see. And not just transgenderism, as I said before, every deviation from the standards found in scripture. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Genesis 1 verse 27, I think you quote this earlier. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And talking about logical fallacy, I heard on a podcast some time ago that this young lady was quoting this verse. And she's saying because the Bible says here, male and female created he them, that, you know, he created male, he created female, and he created them. Them as a pronoun, like as a... Yeah, so... Oh, goodness. Anyways, so definitely God does not make people transgender. The Bible make it clear here in Genesis, and Jesus affirmed it in Matthew, Mm -hmm. that he created male and female. As you said, now because of the fall, sin corrupts God's perfect creation, as transgenderism is a perversion of what God intends. Mm -hmm. Someone again, and I tend to agree, that it's a mental illness, gender dysphoria. But the question begs, what about hermaphrodites, or what we call intersex? And of course, we did episode, I don't remember the number at this point, but it's the redefinition of woman. We did Christian pronouns and free speech. We did LGBTQIA and God. We did Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQI movement. So we have done a number of episodes on this topic. We even did Isaac Simmons and Romans chapter 12, verse 1. All these are episodes you can go back and look at. But sexual abnormalities will be intersex or what we used to call hermaphrodite. And they're just that. The exception never becomes the rule. Right. But here is Pastor Todd from episode 8 talking about this. Well, I, I, there are abnormalities that will play a part, but they're not 
uh, for our good. So, for example, I when I was a youngster growing up in, in elementary school, we had a girl in our uh, school that had two pinkies. Oh, wow. So on one hand, she had six fingers. And that's, that's not a, that's not a norm. Something happened in that mutation. That's from the time of birth. And you see from Genesis chapter two, when Adam and Eve were created in the garden in perfection, they transitioned into chapter three. And the Bible says that Eve was deceived by Satan and that Adam willfully chose to take a bite of the forbidden fruit. And therefore, sin through Adam has passed upon all mankind. So when you and I see sexual abnormalities, it's not directly related to the nature of our God and his desire for uh, us, but it's a part of our fallen race. And so it's a part of the sin uh, nature, the, the nature of our fall from perfection. And these mutations are not mutations that are beneficial. They're actually harmful uh, and difficult for us to address and deal with. Um, I, I've been in some African countries where uh, individuals are um, the product of, of some inbreeding that will go on in many of the tribes. And from that inbreeding where individuals were too closely related and they had children together, um, they would give birth to albinos. And so you're walking down a street and, and you're in the middle of a, of a hut setting or a city setting in Africa and you see uh, an albino. Well, that, that is not a, not a norm, but it's something that comes to us because of our fallen rates and the effects that the fall of Adam has had upon creation. And the Bible says that all of, of um, the creation groans because of the nature of Adam's sin. And so I would point to the scriptures and I'd say that we have these deformities and we've had, we have these abnormalities uh, because of the nature of sin. Yeah. And I have definitely fully agree with that. I think all these things that we see in terms of intersex and stuff like that, mind you, it's a very, very, very small percentage of the population, but still it's definitely a result of sin and not because God is making a mistake in someone's gender. But the question I have to ask, does God make mistakes? I think the Bible tends to differ on that. If you think about Psalms 18 and verse 30, the Bible says, as for God, his way is perfect. Mm -hmm. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler to all those that trust in him. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Had he said, and shall he not do it? Or had he spoken, and shall he not make it good? I want to bring up something here because this guy, Dylan Mulvaney, differs from the Bible in terms of he said that God made him transgendered and he's saying that he know that god didn't make a mistake in making him transgendered here is dylan mulvaney talking about that i don't think that he made a mistake with me um and that maybe one day i will actually be grateful for being trans that this isn't some curse but it's just a different path yeah there you have it so I love the violin, sobby story music they had playing in the background there, too. That's really touching. Yeah, and I wasn't able to take it out because it was over the talking and everything. So, Right. But as he said there, he's basically a perfect epitome of Isaiah 5, verse 20 and 21. The Bible said, One to them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, wanted them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. He's basically saying, hey, he know that God didn't make a mistake in making him chance. And one day he'll be grateful for the fact that he's chance. He just flipped it upside down, basically saying that, hey, God wasn't wise enough. He wasn't smart enough. He wasn't powerful enough to know that he wanted to make Dylan a woman. 
So Dylan don't have to go ahead and now take hormones, go to the surgeons, do all kind of stuff so he can appear and sound and whatever like a woman because God didn't make a mistake in making him chance. It's just mind blowing. The truth is, the truth is Dylan, God did not make a mistake in making you a man. In fact, he loves you so much as a man that he made you, that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you as a man. And if we should take your cells and decide we were going to recreate you, you're not going to be recreated. Regardless of all this hormones that you have taken and all this thing you have gone through, a hundred years from now, someone dig up your cells and test them. They're going to be X, Y. They're not going to change. Not going to change because of all the hormones and all the stuff you take. There are two types of transgenders or transsexuals. There are those like Dylan Mulvaney who are just riding the transgender wave that's taking the country by storm and that are not genuinely afflicted by this particular mental issue. And then there are those who perhaps, because we're in our fallen nature, struggle with this particular problem. This is going to sound very cold, but I don't mean for it to be. I mean for it to be a genuine appeal and a genuine call to people who feel this way to realize what you said, MCG, that Jesus Christ loves them and died for them on the cross. It doesn't matter if you have felt that way since you were small, as people who believe that they are truly dysphoric believe that they have. Or if that you feel that way now, as Dylan Mulvaney claims that he feels right now. The reality is that God calls all men everywhere to repent. Even if you deny God in your transgenderism, in your rejection of his revealed word and his special revelation that is found in scripture, even if you reject all of those things, Even in some ways, apart from all of those things, you are still, as we mentioned before in the beginning of the podcast, made in the image of God. Your conscience speaks against you in this thing as well. You may have seared your conscience, perhaps, but your conscience speaks against you as well. You know this is wrong, and you know this is not the right way. There are some Christians who are appealing to other Christians to say, hey, we need to give these people leeway, allow them to express themselves because some of them were raised in homes where this was okay, or perhaps, you know, they were never taught any better. And I will agree that the way that you were raised has a lot to do with how you see the world as you grow up. But for every single person that is of age, that is old enough to know themselves, the Bible is very clear that everything that can be known about God is clearly seen in his creation. And Romans 1 says the rejection of that general revelation will lead people to lose their minds. In other words, there is no excuse whether you felt like that way from childhood or whether you feel that way when you're 30-something. It does not matter. God calls all men everywhere to repent, according to Acts 17, verses 30 to 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. And I would just like to second what MCG said. He died for the transgender, for the transsexual as well. Yeah, but he said something here about some folks kind of truly in their minds may think so. And I don't know if Dylan Mulvaney does this, but some folks may do it just because of the clout that he may bring Mm -hmm. or the attention, narcissistic kind of people. But have you ever wondered if these people are trying to basically draw attention to themselves, being narcissistic or even being, you know, willfully trying to confuse us? Here is an audio of a member of the chance LGBTQIA community saying basically that this person, they willfully confuse people for whatever reason, but here's the clip. When I saw this headline on Twitter, I was immediately like, that is the most trans thing I have ever read. Do you know how many times I've changed a label, stopped using a label, or just don't use a label around certain people or groups because I don't feel like being harassed or having to explain myself? 
I stopped saying I have he, him pronouns to cis strangers because the look of confusion and processing in their eyes was a little too much for me to bear consistently. Introducing myself as non-binary instead of trans mask if I'm wearing a dress or makeup because I don't feel like explaining that. But also telling cis family members to use he, him pronouns for me because I know they don't understand non-binary identities. Calling myself trans mask when I want to connect with other trans mask people about hormones and identities. But then only going by non-binary in other spaces because there's so many queer people that hate trans men and trans masks but are okay with non-binary people. Saying that I'm in a sapphic relationship with my girlfriend when both of us don't like using that label and consider our relationship to be lesbian. And the thing is, I'm not even doing this around cishet people. I'm doing this around other queer people. My labels, identities, pronouns vary day to day, minute to minute, based on how much I feel like explaining myself, how much I feel like confusing people, and how tired I am. When they say you will never stop coming out, they mean it. No, I don't even know oh what to say about word. that, but that they was... have it, folks. So they want you to use the pronouns based on how they feel that day. And they want you to believe that they are somehow trans based on how they feel that day. I guess the short, we can say no thank you, but... If the devil can keep us in a perpetual state of confusion, I mean, that's what he desires to do. Which is another reason why the entire transgender movement, if you've noticed, particularly pursue children. This idea of pushing children to explore deviations and sexual identity and expression and pushing to sexualize children early, all of these things have the aim and the goal of confusing people, confusing children. Confused children grow up to be very confused adults. And so God is not the author of confusion. That's the devil. So on its face, it's demonic. And so this person is saying all of these things. All of our eyes are crossing and glazing over because we can't even keep up with the number of different identities and genders and ways that people prefer to be identified. And this person, I don't think it's a she doesn't sound like a she sounds like a he pretending to be a she. But anyway, they sound very much like running through the vocabulary, showing how they know it's like a virtue signaling of, oh, I'm up to date with the latest queer LGBTQIA nonsense because you know, I'm this, that, or the other. Oh, but you don't get it. You're confused. You're just not on my level. Come up to my level type of thing. There's no need for any of this. It doesn't benefit society. It certainly doesn't help the person themselves to remain in a perpetual state of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Yep, I fully agree. And you're listening to the Removing Barriers podcast. We are talking about a TikTok video by a member of the LGBTQIA community who claimed that Eve the very first woman that was created in scripture was transgendered. We'll be right back. This is the Removing Barriers podcast. If the podcast or the blog were a blessing to you, leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to share the podcast with your friends. Removing Barriers, a clear view of the cross. Hi, this is Jay. MCG and I would like for you to help us remove barriers by going to removingbarriers.net and subscribing to receive all things Removing Barriers. If you'd like to take your efforts a bit further and help us keep the mics on, consider donating at removingbarriers.net slash donate. Removing Barriers, a clear view of the cross. Well, you know, MCG, a lot of the people in the transgender movement slash transsexual identity would say that this is a part of their lived experience, the fact that they feel that they're male when they're actually female or that they're female when they're actually male. The question begs, is being a man or woman based on any of our lived experience or how we feel as they claim it is? Absolutely not. (laughs) Reality does not change based on your feelings or even your experience. And of course, we know Gen Zs and maybe millennials to some extent, but mostly Gen Zs, they use the word live experience or the experience, aka they mean in their truth. Mm. And we still live in a world of absolutes. You don't get to have your truth and my truth. There is the truth and the truth is not based on your feelings. As Ben Shapiro would say, facts do not care about your feelings. So no, you cannot one day feel like you're a man and decide, hey, well, I'm a man today. Or tomorrow, well, I feel like a woman, so I'm a woman. Or another day, feel like you're neither, and all of a sudden, you're none. It doesn't work that way. 
And if you remember in episode 137, we had Delano Squires on mm -hmm. and he said, we cannot ex nihilio, meaning out of nothing, create our own truths or realities. So sorry, but yeah, your feelings do not create reality. I understand though that your feeling might appear as reality, but that doesn't make them reality. You know, you can argue that if that's the way you feel, it might be true for you in a sense, if you want to put it that way. If you're hurt, I can understand the hurt might be real, but that doesn't mean everything else being of it is true or even reality. But they would say hurt, whether perceived or real, will ultimately end up being real because transgenders are at a greater risk of self-deletion or self-harm because it's real in their head. And so surely you can make an exception for them, right? Well, I'm saying if you're offering some sort of counsel or some sort of comfort to them, you don't want to dismiss the way they feel. Just be flipping or dismissing the way they feel. Just like a child would come to their parents feeling a certain way because of something that happened. As a parent, you know that this thing that the child is making a fuss over is basically nothing. But at the same time, you don't dismiss the child feelings. But at the same time, you're not going to affirm the lack of reality within the child. So example, this was a follow-up. This wasn't necessarily knocking on doors. This was a follow-up of someone who visited my church. And while we were talking to him, asking about his salvation experience and everything, he gave a testimony of salvation. Then he started talking about his children. And he started telling us about his oldest child, who was 18 at the time. And he said that his oldest is actually transitioning. and He's basically affirming his oldest child because he doesn't want his oldest child to harm himself. So he said the oldest child now is changing from a man into a woman. He said he doesn't necessarily agree with it, but it also at the same time he doesn't want to, quote unquote, believe the lie of the society that if you don't affirm it, then the child is going to end up and kill themselves or whatever, and he's going to lose his child. So he's basically saying, I prefer a live daughter than a dead son. I hear that often, yeah. Basically, the little lie of the society. Right. And I didn't, at that point, necessarily, you know, crack the Bible open, point in his face and say, no, this person can never be. But at that point, because he was hurting and he was basically pouring out his heart to a stranger because he didn't know me when I went to visit. He just happened to come to our church, fill out the visitor's card and went and visited him. So I showed him grace with some truth, but I didn't go in dismissing his feelings. Mm -hmm. Now, afterwards, I did call my pastor and tell my pastor, hey, you probably want to go make a visit to this guy <laughs> <laughs> because this one is above my peer grade. But whatever the case may be, we do have to acknowledge that there's some feelings and stuff like that involved. And, you know, you're not going to meet a gay couple and say, hey, no, you know, you guys are living in sin. That has its place and time where you want to say that. But at the same time, I'm not going to congratulate them on their marriage. Right. You know, I had a coworker who once told me, hey, yeah, I got married this past summer and blah, 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 blah. And he got married to a man, quote unquote, because the people of the same gender can't get married, according to the Bible. But I didn't say congratulations at the same time. I just let it be. It was in a work situation and I let it be. But if it was a situation where he was asking me directly, what are my thoughts and feelings about it or what the Bible says about it? I'll be honest with him and tell him. If I should sit down with him and he want my honest opinion on the issue, I will tell him. But this guy problem is not so much so that he's married, quote unquote, to a man. It's the fact that he's not safe. Mm -hmm. Anyways, the question is about, you know, their live experience and their feelings. No, their feelings does not change reality. But at the same time, you want to season your conversation with grace as well, because you don't want to necessarily be a Stephen Anderson. This was a Stephen Anderson. I listened to another preacher once, and he said that he thinks that we should line up all the LGBTQIA people and just shoot them. Oh, what a terrible thing to say. Yeah, I, I disagree with That's that guy. Awful. That's hateful. Mm -hmm. Or the people that were celebrating at the Pulse nightclub shooting because 50 right. or so people died. Right. That's just absolutely ungodly. That's the wrong thing to say. Right. So, but at the same time, I'm not going to affirm their sin and affirm their belief. But if I get the opportunity, I would definitely share the gospel with them. And I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, when it changed you, 
it does just change your heart, but it changes your entire lifestyle. It's not come as you are, stay as you are, leave as you are. It's come as you are and be transformed into the image of Christ. Christians absolutely need to be spirit-led and spirit-filled in dealing with this particular situation because you're dealing with people who are not only deceived themselves, but are emboldened in their sin and in their decision by the permissive environment of the world right now. And so where, as before, society would provide some sort of external check on their sinful behavior, now it's being celebrated. Now it is tolerated, not even tolerated, celebrated. And if you oppose, you are somehow a bigot. And so the only way to speak with someone with grace and truth, as you mentioned, MCG, is by being approaching it with much prayer. There are demons that do not depart unless there's fasting and prayer involved. And this is demonic activity here. We're at the demonic level there. But also the scriptures telling us, I know that in the scriptures, when the Lord tells us, don't even prepare what you're going to say when you have to stand before the authorities to give an account for the truth and for the faith. The same thing can be applied here. In other words, being led by the Holy Spirit, who will lead you according to the scriptures to say what needs to be said. The Lord knows the spiritual condition of that person so much more than you think you do. And so leaning on the Lord when you're talking to the person so that the double-edged sword of the Spirit can just pierce and divide us under that heart that has been hardened by their self-deception, but also by the world's encouragement of that self-deception is really important. Being a man or a woman, as we mentioned before, is not based on our lived experiences. It's based on what thus saith the Lord, male and female created he them. We're made in the image of God. If it were the case that it was a result of our lived experience, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. But it's obviously not the case. The reality is God made them male and female. It's a hard biological fact. It's a hard spiritual fact. It's tied to the fact that we are image bearers of the one true God. The argument that transsexuals and transgender people make is that gender is so much more of a nuanced discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a gradient, there's shades to this, there's gray here. And the problem is that they're trying to have this nuanced discussion outside of the prism of biblical truth. And so any perceived benevolent aim that they would have, because they'll always tell you, oh, we just want to be accepted and be contributing and loving members of society. And we just care about all of these transgender people that are killing themselves because they're not accepted by their society. And all of these benevolent, highfalutin things that they say that they're aiming, what they don't realize is that none of those things can truly be attained apart from or divorced from God, because God is good. God is the father of all life. He's the father of all good gifts. And everything that is good comes from God. Our fallen nature must and will only exacerbate the problem. And so because the end goal is just a relief from this mental torment that they have or a, some type of appeasement or assuagement, just make it better. That's all they're aiming for. Well, then they're necessarily falling short of the ultimate end of man, which is the glory of God, which means divorced from the glory of God. You cannot, you can't deal with this transsexual problem. You can't deal with the transgender issue. There is no relief. There is no rest, says God, for the wicked. And so apart from God, it can't happen. And so it doesn't matter how you feel. We say this with love and with a genuine desire for people to see the truth. It doesn't matter how we feel. And I won't even say the Ben Shapiro quip that is so famous. Oh, facts don't care about your feelings. It even goes further. It goes beyond that. It goes to the very heart of the issue that the glory of God is at stake here. And you cannot find peace apart from that. No true good exists apart from God, because God is good. God is love. It's a hard line, but it's a true one. Christians really need to hold the line. Be moved by the Spirit, absolutely, talking to people about this particular issue when you're at the door, at work, talking to friends, talking to family members. But our Lord came into this world full of grace and truth. We ought to be doing the same. I definitely agree. Well, what about hormonal treatment? Can hormonal treatment, stupid blockers, and all these other things that they're given young kids even cause one to change their gender or their sex. I think the same is true for hormonal blockers and puberty blockers. And what's sinister about this is that the advocates that would seek to make these things available to the prepubescent are doing so under the guise of helping them, when in reality they are fundamentally changing their physical development in ways that are 
irretractable. You can't go back and fix it. You can't change it. If you go on puberty blockers before puberty hits, you are forever changed physically in the sense that the results, whether you're put on testosterone, if you're trying to become male, or if you're, I don't know, put on estrogen or whatever else, there's also Lupron or whatever they're trying to do to these children, the chemical castration and all those sorts of things, they have lifelong consequences. But down in your genes, down in your chromosomes, down to your very cells, all the way down, you're still male or female, yeah. male or female created he then. And they have a lot of quote unquote chance. I don't believe that anyone can be chance, but mm-hmm. anyway, that's the way we speak, quote unquote the transitioners were coming out and saying the very same thing. But, you know, the problem is, is that even though these hormones and all these can change your appearance, because I'll be honest, there's some of them that pictures I've seen that I can't tell mm-hmm. whether these person, a man or woman or whatever. So hormonal treatment, surgery and all these things could let you appear like the opposite sex, but that doesn't make you the opposite sex. You know, I quoted Delano Squires, is not about cosmetic, it's about composition. And hormones and all these things do not change your chromosomes. And here is Delano talking about this. You could bring your wife, or your, if you're dating at the time, your girlfriend, a six-carat cubic zirconia. <laughs> and then it doesn't matter if you needed a pickup truck to bring it to her. At the end of the day, that is not a diamond. Not a diamond, right. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter the color, the cut, the clarity. The issue is composition. It's not cosmetic. Yeah. So I fully agree with Delana there. They are trying to put on, quote unquote, a mass over this and they're mutilating their bodies and stuff like that. I guess the next question is, does bodily mutilation cause someone to be transgendered? And I guess Delana just answered that question Mm -hmm. there that, no, it's not. It does not change anything. Because as they say, if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig, Mm -hmm. you know? So... All these things that they're doing to their bodies and stuff like that, whether chemically, bodily mutation and stuff like that, does not change. But it's funny, though, because the transgender will tell you, or the transgender community will tell you that it's not about hardware, it's about software. But why is it that they want to swap out their hardware and that will affirm their software? Or in other words, if your sexual organs do not determine your gender, how does mutilating it affirm your gender? Or if gender is not on a binary scale, why is it that when you're mutilating your body, your choice is binary? Mm. You're removing one or cutting up one to create the other or taking flesh from some place on your body to create another one. But having the hardware does not make you who you are. Right. But then you need to remove it or cut it up. In order to affirm to affirm it. The software. It makes absolutely no sense. There is a trans activist by the professional name of Amazon Eve. And this man said that passability is very important to the transgender or the transsexual. And passability means that the person can pass for the gender that they're seeking to be. And the only way to achieve passability is to take the hormones prepubescently before puberty sets in. He gave an example of himself because he's 6'8", 6'8", and he said that he didn't have the care at the time. And if I had the care that I needed at that time, I would never have grown to be 6'8". And just listening to him, I thought, why would you need, as you're saying here, why would you need the physical to affirm the mental if that's all you actually need to be the particular gender that you think you are? Well, it's because they're fighting against the truth. They're fighting against what they know to be true. And I'll say this as well. Isaiah 43, 7 says, this is in the context of Israel, but it's true for us today, that God says, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. John 1 says that there is nothing in this world that is made, that is not made by God. and so. You could say the individual person is being described here. God created, God formed them, and it says why he did so, for his glory. And I will go so far as to say this, I'm going to jump to Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 to 6. The context here is marriage, because the men came to Jesus and said, you know, can we divorce our wife for any reason? Moses said, just give her a letter of divorcement, but what do you say? And he says, In verse 4, the Lord Jesus says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female 
and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the physical reality of the oneness of a husband and wife, of a man and a woman, is the child. The child is like in the flesh, half of her DNA, half of his DNA come together to make one flesh. I know that's not the context here, but what I'm getting at is that what God has put together, the Bible says that he knit us in the womb, Jeremiah says, from the very beginning, he made us and made us for a particular purpose. You can't put that asunder. You can't chop that up and change it into what you want it to be. You can't take these poisons that halt your pubescent development because you don't feel a particular way. Who do you think you are? You are not your own. Whether you acknowledge the God who created you or not, you cannot do this. You must not do this. It is a sin against the God who created you. You are sinning against your own flesh, and it's not going to do anything to ameliorate the effect of sin that is a result of the fall in you. The only solution to that is submission to the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Bible, the truth of the creator God who created you, the truth of the Bible. That's the only way out of this. There is no other way out of this. You may not, you must not do this. Can't change your gender. And there is no such thing as gender in the head being different from what's between the legs, as they crudely say, what your physical reality is. There is no changing of your gender, whether you mutilate yourself, whether it's the hormone treatments, whether you go by the way you feel, there is no such thing. And so that's one thing about what the Bible says about being transgender. What would you say, MCG, what are some other things the Bible says about being transgender? Well, I'll just tack on to what you just said and say this. I personally think that transgenderism is an outplay of Romans 1. Yes. And I spoke about this in the episode God and LGBTQIA. And I'm just going to reiterate that point again. I think transgenderism is the outplay of the final step of the reptobate mind. Because again, when you think about it and the logical fallacy that they use and the fact that you can't define a woman, I can't define that any other way than a reptobate mind. But when it comes to human sexuality, firstly, I want to say that God defines human sexuality. Why? Because he's God. Mm -hmm. He's the creator. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. He's the creator. He's the one who created human sexuality. And human sexuality in light of the Bible is something that is beautiful. It's something that when it's done within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman, the Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. So I believe that God defines human sexuality because he's God. I believe that creation determines it. Genesis 1 verse 27, as we read before, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 2 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they two shall be one flesh. So God defines it. Creation determines it. And also Jesus affirms it. You think about Matthew 19 verse 46, where you just read there, Jay, where the Bible reiterate the Genesis 1.27 and the Genesis 2.24 verses that I just read, where they talk about one flesh, male and female created he them in the beginning. Jesus affirms what creation determines and what God defines. But not only that, we see that my last point here would be Paul agrees with it. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, a bishop then should be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior given to hospitality, apt to teach. Ephesians 5, verse 31 and 33, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Paul agrees with all of them. So all through the Bible, from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, the Bible is consistent and coherent 
in human sexuality. But Paul continues in Romans 1, 24 to 31. The Bible says, Wherefore, as God gave them up to uncleanness, to the loss of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who change the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forevermore. Amen. I think that right here, as I said in the previous episode, that this has already happened. They're giving up unto uncleanness. I don't think necessarily, even though you can say part of it is homosexuality, but I think here these are the heterosexuals who have now leave marriage and the sexual revolution that we have gone through. Even the rise of contraceptive where men and women now are loose with their bodies. Mm -hmm. That's uncleanness. And when we accept that in society because it was heterosexuals who were being unclean, when we accept that in society, I think God gave them up to uncleanness. And the Bible continues, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. I think the vile affection here is now homosexuality. The Bible says, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one to another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves the recompense of the error, which was meat. I believe this is the 80s and 90s of the rise of the LGBTQIA, where now it was ultimately now accepted in the society. So heterosexual sins were never dealt with. It grew into vile affections, into the homosexuality. And the Bible continues here, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reptibate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, impeccable, unmerciful. And I think we are right here in this verse in our society today. Mm that we have been given over to a reptibate mind. And I think that's where we see the transgenderism, the trans species, because some of them claim to be, they transition into different species, whether it's a dog or a wolf or whatever. Reptibate mind, where we can't define a woman, we lost the ability to reason. Let's look at what Hillary Clinton said the other day, that folks need to be deprogrammed. The MAGA folks need to be deprogrammed. Yet if mm-hmm. you ask Hillary Clinton, what is a woman, she wouldn't even be able to tell you a clear definition of a woman. Just like when Justice Katanji Brown was asked, she couldn't give a clear definition of a woman. It's a reptibate mind and they have been given over. So what we've seen here is the progression of sin. So Paul agrees with it. God defines it. Creation determines it. Jesus affirms it. Paul agrees with it. First Timothy 1, verse 8 to 11. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for warmongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for the perjured person, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And of course, we have 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, They know he not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. But verse 11 says, And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. The Bible says, Such were some of you. Such was Jay. Such was I. But I can declare unto you that I have been washed. I have been sanctified. I have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And we all too can be washed and sanctified by repentant faith in Jesus Christ, recognizing that we are wretched sinners in need of a Savior. 
and turn into Christ Jesus in repentant faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, 10, and 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My plea for you is that you may call upon the name of the Lord today. Thank you so much for listening to the Removing Barriers podcast. Make sure to rate us everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher. Removing Barriers, a clear view of the cross. Thank you for listening. To get a hold of us, to support this podcast, or to learn more about Removing Barriers, go to removingbarriers.net. This has been the Removing Barriers podcast. We attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross.